All right, so let's look at an example of, of using these ideas when we don't know sigma when we're, we're doing a confidence interval for mu here. Okay, so we've, we've seen a similar example to this in the past where, say, our goal is to estimate the average height of, of all males in Virginia. All right, now, a previous example we looked at, we said, okay, let's just assume sigma equal to some number. Right, but now let's let's take a more realistic approach and let's say we don't actually have information about the population. Right? In practice, when we're doing this stuff, this is actually more likely, right? That we don't know all this stuff about the population. If we knew all this stuff about the population, then then why would we be doing any of this? Right? So usually we actually don't have that much information about the population. And let's say we're taking a sample now of size 24. So no population information, small sample, maybe my sample looks like this, if you want to work alongside what I'm doing. So from here, we want to start taking a look at this data. So I'm going to, so our goal is going to be, we want to make a 95% confidence interval to do this estimation. Right? I'm going to start looking at this sample. Now I'm going to do this in mini tab because it's, it's pretty easy to work with, but you could do this in anything. So I'm just going to get some basic statistics here. So display descriptives. Um, I think our default options will give us pretty much everything we want here. Okay, so I'm going to click in this heights variable and just use the default list of statistics. Okay, so it gives me my mean, n, we know is 24, standard deviation. Remember this is the sample standard deviation or S. Alright, so so I've got all my basic information about my sample here. Okay, so that's going to be helpful. But then remember since we're trying to use our t-distribution technically we need to check some conditions. Alright, those conditions are we don't want to see any we don't want to see outliers and we don't want to see really bad skewness. Now there's a, and usually we can check these visually just pretty quick and easily. Right, we can use a box plot. We know a box plot is a good tool to check for outliers. We know a histogram is our best tool to look at the shape of a distribution. And a newer tool that we saw are normal probability plots. And they are actually really good tools for looking at both of these things all in one spot. All right, so so we'll look how to do look at how to do this in Minitab. So to make a box plot, we can simply go to one Y, put my heights in there. Now I like to click this transpose button just to get a horizontal box plot. It's just a personal preference thing. All right, so don't see outliers in the box plot. I'm gonna make a histogram, just simple. Heights. Um, let's see, and let's just use the. So looking at the default histogram, it gives me. Uh, I don't. I don't love it because there's kind of a gap here. Um, it's using one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bins. So maybe if we just use say seven bins, get rid of that gap, and I prefer cut points to midpoints. And okay, so here this histogram looks pretty good. Looks pretty symmetric. All right, I think I think we like that. Okay, so looking good on our conditions, no outliers. It's a histogram where if I just want to go one place, a little bit more advanced version, there's my normal probability plot. So now we're just going to want to plug into our formula. All right, so our formula, we know what that looks like. Now these other numbers we've already calculated, we'll just boom, 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 just plug those right in. Okay, but the only other thing we need it is our critical value. Okay, so we're going to need to let's see, look at an example of using our table here to find our t critical value. Okay, so the big thing with the t distribution is your degrees of freedom. Okay, now we're going to use 95% confidence level. So when we're looking up a critical value for a 95% confidence interval, we think, okay, 95%, 1 minus 95%, divide by 2. Right, so 1 minus 
over 2. So we would look up our closest value to 0 0.025 in the table. Now remember, we're using a different table, the t table here. Okay, so the t table, a lot of t tables are set up a little bit differently from your um, from your z table. Okay, because we have degrees of freedom to deal with over here in this column. All right, so and maybe you felt like when you were using the z table, did you ever feel like you were kind of just looking the same thing up over and over? Well, we have those commonly used probabilities up here across this one in our t-table. We have our degrees of freedom here. So we find where the confidence level we're interested in intersects with the degrees of freedom, and that's our critical value. So the, the way the t-table is set up, I'd argue it's a little bit easier to use to find critical values. Now, we're going to run into some limitations that we'll see, but it's a little easier to get critical values, right? So 23 degrees of freedom, so go down to 23. 95% confidence level, so I'm working in my 95% column. Boom, there we go. They intersect at 2.069. So we got all the pieces that we need. We checked our assumptions. We got all the pieces for this formula. Plug it in. There we go. Now let's think interpretation-wise. Should we still be able to interpret this similar to a z-interval? Well, yes, because it's, it's doing the same job that the z-interval does, right? It's trying to estimate that parameter okay so we're still we're still doing the same thing here right but it's just calculated a little bit different so we interpret it the same all right so another interpretation that we looked at before with z intervals was if I created a whole bunch of intervals we'd expect your confidence level percent of them to do their job correctly so we want to know does this hold for the t distribution as well. And simulated this in a computer program and found, so I did 1100 of them and found that 1046 of them captured me. These were all 95% confidence intervals with a sample size of 24 like we've been using, 95%. And we see that looks like 95% of them did do their job. The green ones are the ones that missed it or that, that captured the parameter. This is the black parameter in the middle. The red ones are the ones that did not. Now maybe we notice something. So it seems like this interpretation is the same between Z and T, but there is kind of a subtle difference between Z and T intervals. Okay, now when we created multiple Z intervals, they were all they all had the same interval width. Right, so remember the next thing we want to think about with confidence intervals, we, we wanted to be able to calculate them, that's easy. We wanted to be able to interpret them, and we wanted to think about their behavior a little bit. Especially the behavior if I adjust certain components, what does the width of this interval look like? Because we know that a more narrow or more precise interval is more useful to us. So if I created a whole bunch of Z intervals with everything else held constant, all of those Z intervals would look the same. Right? But we see here these t intervals, right? They vary in size. It's easy to so here. It's kind of probably easier to see the red ones. So see the, how this red one is smaller than this one. All right. So let's take a closer look at why that is with two intervals. So the first and second samples that we took. The first sample was calculated like this. The second sample was calculated like this. Now we know the sample means are going to change slightly. Right, because they're just different samples. But remember, the whole idea of the t-distribution, I'm adding in more variability because I'm also estimating sigma with s. s is a statistic. s is going to change based on the sample that I take. All right, so if s is variable, even if I leave everything else constant, not only are the intervals going to shift left and right, their margin of errors are going to change. Therefore, their interval widths are going to change. Okay. So, in general, we also see that T critical values are a little bit bigger than Z critical values because we know as, right, we know this point already, as N goes to infinity, then the T distribution moves towards the Z, 
And maybe we could kind of look at that on the table. So let's bring back up our T table. So we know for a 95% Z confidence interval, your critical value is 1.96. That's what we use for 95% Z. Okay, so let's look at the 95% T values. Well, for one degree of freedom, that's a huge critical value. That would be a really, really big interval. Here it's four, three point something, two point something. We see it getting smaller and smaller as our degrees of freedom decrease. So let's see how small it gets. So by the time I'm at degrees of freedom equal to 100, remember 1.96 is what we use for Z. It's here at 1.98. And it's actually, we see, converging on if our degrees of freedom was infinity, we'd use 1.96. So these are z-critical values down here at the bottom. Those might look familiar. 1.645, 1.96, 2.56. All right? So we know the t, these t-critical values are becoming smaller as your degrees of freedom gets bigger, but they're always going to be slightly bigger than its z-counterpart. All right, so that's one thing to point out. So in general, T intervals are going to be wider, but there's much more. So the point we're trying to make here when we're thinking about the behavior of T confidence intervals right, is can I do this process like we did with Z where if I have an interval in mind that I want, a, a, a width that I would be happy with, and a confidence level that I'm happy with, what sample size do I need to achieve that? Well, you can do that with T intervals, but the problem is when we're... S is variable, and when we're playing around with our sample size, remember we have different critical values for each sample size. Okay, so there is a way to do this, and it has to do with kind of just approximating what you want in with a Z critical value, right, and then adjusting, right. Basically, this process is kind of a pain in the butt, and we'll leave it up to software for the most part. Okay, so we can find do sample size calculations for Z intervals, but for T intervals, we we don't usually do those ourselves. We're going to leave that up to a computer. All right, so we'll look at an example of a T hypothesis test soon. Thanks for tuning in.